what we do is never going to be the most popular thing and it's never the easiest thing. Dozens of breweries have opened in Seattle since we opened and there was already a ton before then. Uh, my philosophy was, well, let's do something different. Let's try and bring something different to the table that nobody else is really doing very well. Started making soda, condition them in the bottle, give them carbonation, you'd put a little bit of yeast in, then you would stall the fermentation by putting the soda in the fridge, which come to find out is extremely dangerous and no one should have ever put that into print. But uh, that was how I started. And then I met a, a friend uh, who was a pretty avid home brewer. We got together with some friends and we made a batch of home brew and it was absolutely disastrous. And I was so frustrated that I went and spent like two weeks just reading every homebrew book I could find. I'd been a brewer in England for a bit. When I moved over here, I was really excited about the array of American beers. But after not that long, I was like, I kind of miss the traditional British car scales. Other people's examples of it here didn't really, just wasn't really my cup of tea. So rented this cool old building and started doing our thing. Started in brewing uh, the summer between my junior and senior years of college. Um, washing floors, making boxes. I got to you know work on the balling line if it was my lucky day. Somebody was fired and I got promoted into the cellar and kind of from there was promoted onto the brew house and learned to brew. I had a job offer at Elysian, so 2011 or so. Stayed at Elysian until uh, 2015, and then opened up this place. Craft beer is, you know, punk rock, and so when it's sold out, there's something that to me uh, diminishes the soul of the beer of the company, and it waters it down, and it kind of it turns it into just any other commodity in any other business, and I don't think beer is like that. I set it up so that I could brew and I can make the beer long term. And most of the brewery owners that I knew didn't make beer anymore. You know, when you're a brewer, it's, it's not good on your, your knees, it's not good on your back. So you, you've kind of got a window. And so I wanted to do it as long as I could. And there was also just the sense of trying to, to do something more focused stylistically. And, and the beers that I'd always brewed were pretty much sort of Belgian style beers, Cezanne farmhouse beers, and English cask beers. And even though I had interest in and had brewed a lot of other styles, I felt like there were enough people doing that that what I wanted to do was something that was a, a counterpoint to what was out there. When we make a beer, we don't really have to uh, pay attention to the cost of ingredients. We don't have to make a beer that's just purely demand-based. We don't have to meet a certain deadline or timeline here, um, which a lot of big breweries have, you know, seasonal releases that have to be out on a certain date or make so many dollars, you know, per keg. They have to work with certain vendors because, you know, those are like approved by the company and things like that. So we do whatever we want um, here and then we figure it out later. There's no greater benefit than being your own boss. You know, it's also 100% on you to succeed. You know, you're paying people that have families, and if you aren't uh, successful, you know, you're not the only one going down. You're, there are other people that you're affecting, lives that you're affecting. If you start a brewery in a small town in the Midwest, you want to be welcoming to people, and so it, sort of behooves you to brew a diversity of styles. Uh, I felt like, you know, we're in Seattle, there's a, there's a lot of breweries, and not every brewery needs to be everything to everyone. You can do a niche brewery. Uh, and I usually say that Floodland is way more like an art project than a business. I'm the only full-time person. 
I have a bunch of friends that help me out part-time and they're really passionate about it and it wouldn't happen without them. But we don't, we don't really run it like a business. We don't run it with business goals in mind. There is, in the beer industry, just, just, just staying in existence for six years is a, is a feat in itself. So, you know, um, I think your beer is getting better all the time, which I think ours has. That's a good sign. Um, I just want to make good beer that people will want to drink and I know is good. And then I think not all breweries do that. <laughs> yeah. It seems like obvious, but I know from being in the industry and talking to a lot of other brewers that people do a lot of things that they don't like. They don't think it's good, but it sells. And we don't do a lot of the stuff that we don't like, but it sells. We hold true to our value of like, we are making beer that we truly enjoy to drink as well. I mean, we don't make a milkshake IPA because I wouldn't drink a milkshake IPA. And I know people would line up for some canned milkshake IPAs, but uh, that is a little disingenuous to me. There's obviously pros and cons to that. If we go out of business next year, then, you know, it's gonna look a little stupid. But uh, in the meantime, people will respect us for it. You know, over hundreds of years, we've domesticated brewer's yeast and put it into lab environments so that it's really predictable. Like you drill by Sierra Nevada Palo, and those guys are the masters of making beer that's super consistent. You can go buy it in Indiana or Massachusetts or Washington, and it's always going to taste really good. And it's always going to taste the same. So that's the goal of most breweries is to make those really clean, really consistent beers. With mixed culture beers, you can't make the same base beer and have it turn out the same way twice. Your target, everything's always shifting. So because of that, if you sort of take your eye off the ball, you have to start over basically. Cask beer is naturally carbonated in the traditional method, served without CO2 and served at cellar temperature, so it's 50 to 55 degrees. The customer gets something that is served less cold, less carbonated, and with diminishing freshness from the time it's tapped. Basically, we're looking for a sweet spot to serve the beer where it's like perfect. And uh, so what makes a really good one is if it's served the right way. Just the craft of handling and serving the beer, having really attention to detail on uh, carbonation, temperature, freshness, because the reputation is warm and flat, and we never ever want warm and flat beer. It's taken a lot of time to kind of educate people who are drinking the beers, like what our intentions are and what our visions are. So, you know, if you're looking at a hazy IPA, our IPAs look hazy, there's some bitterness there. They certainly have fruit forward hop components to them, but they're not sweet. And it's confusing for labels and things like that. But there's a really interesting flavor balance that you can get from beers with mixed culture fermentations. It's a slower process usually. The beers take months, but they're different than what you're used to seeing on the shelf. And they have a lot of character to them and people respond to that. Explaining to people kind of what we're trying to do is, you know, making a, an IPA that kind of bridges modern with some old style characteristics that pairs well with food is kind of like where we're going. I'm a tiny brewery, and so there's more demand than there is supply. So my goal is just to spread the beer around and have it be a little egalitarian and make it so that people who get the beer have a positive experience with it. I think we've done a pretty solid job with like staying true to who we are and hoping that that resonates with people that are drinking.